Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Seventh Day Church of Revelation. Babylon is a very popular name that is mentioned uh, in the Bible. You got the story of Daniel with his friends in Babylon, but then you also have the name Babylon being mentioned in the book of Revelation. So we're going to dive in to the scriptures. We're going to look into who is Babylon. Um, is there anybody that is part of Babylon? And what does it mean to drink out of the wine of its fornication or her fornication? What constitute Babylon and its teachings? So let's dive in. Let's go to the book of Revelation. Revelations 14 and verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So the name here is given, Babylon. What does Babylon mean? And what does Babylon or what has Babylon done uh, according to this verse? says that because she made all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What does it mean to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication? And what's the meaning of the name Babylon? Let's go to the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, we're going to see uh, what it says. It says, therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So Babylon is a name given that its meaning means confusion. Um, that's why it's been given other nations to drink of her wrath, of her fornication, which is confusion. Confusion to what? To the scriptures. Teaching doctrines that are not found in the scriptures. Let's go into the book of Thoughts on Daniels and Revelations to dig a little bit deeper in regards to this uh, name, Babylon. Babylon is not confined to the Romish church. That this church is a very prominent component, part of Great Babylon, is not denied. The description of chapter 17 seemed to apply very particularly to that church. But the name which she bears on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, reveals other family connections. If this church is the mother, who are the daughters? The fact that these daughters are spoken of shows that they are other religious bodies besides the Romish church which come under this designation. The great city, Babylon, is spoken of as composed of three divisions. So the great religions of the world may be arranged under three heads. The first, oldest, and most widely spread is paganism, separately symbolized under the form of a dragon. The second is the great Romish apostasy, symbolized by the beast, and the third is the daughters or descendants from that church. So paganism, apostasy of the Romish church, and the descendants or daughters of, uh, of Babylon. Paganism has been creeping into the churches, in all Protestant churches. One of those teachings or practices of paganism is, for example, the Day of the Dead, which in the uh, Catholic church is very common, very popular, a celebration that is done. Um, uh, the, the other one that it's called, instead of calling it the Day of the Dead, is uh, Halloween. Halloween is a practice that some Protestant churches have also been practicing. Some of them call it Fall Fest, where they allow the kids or the youth to show up on that day or specific day that they designate 
and dress up. Um, they say so that they don't have to go out and be unsafe, but it's still um, bringing in paganism into the church. The other one is uh, the triketra, which is a symbol uh, that its origin is from paganism, um, but now has been incorporated to um, represent the Trinity. Another form of paganism that has been introduced is through yoga. Yoga is very popular. Uh, many Christians, many Protestants have adopted this type of exercise that they call, but its origin is, comes from paganism. Um, we see, for example, even here in this uh, slide, where Advent classes, it says, join us live on holy yoga. So the that word that they add there is holy. So that seems to give it a little bit of an appearance that is something safe because of that word holy. Um, this is a, a Seventh-day Adventist church in Arizona that invites all its um, community to partake of this exercise. And as you see here on this image, it's, it's a common practice or a common uh, pose in Hinduism for meditation. Uh, we could see some of the other images where we could see how Hinduism, they have these poses that is origin, again, uh, in paganism. They they say the more you meditate, you release power from your body. The power is within. Another pose we see here is, um, um, here in the image, is a very common pose in yoga. And this other slide. Um, they say it's to stretch your back, but again, all its origin is from Hinduism or uh, is pagan. Let's see what else does the scripture says in regards to this um, this great city, the Babylon and its daughters. In the book of Revelation sixteen thirteen, we read, "And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast." and out of the mouth of the false prophet. As we just read a while ago, the dragon is paganism. Um, the beast represents apostate Catholicism. And the mouth of the false prophet is the Protestant churches. All these unite, dragon, beast, and the false prophet. They all unite. They do not teach um, um, or have certain teachings that are not in accordance to the Bible. Now, in the following verse, in Revelation 13, we read the following. And deceiveth them that dwelt on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword, and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So what is the practice here? It follows and it persecutes and it kills. The same thing that um, Catholic Church did in the Holy Inquisition. But the in the Holy Inquisition, Many times the church, the Roman church, is only mentioned, but that is not the case. As we see on the next slide, history tells us, for example, Michael Servetus. He died October 27, 1553 in Chample, Switzerland. Was a Spanish physician and theologian whose unorthodox teachings led to his condemnation as a heretic by both Protestants and Roman Catholics, and to his execution by Calvinists from Geneva. So we see here the um, two in agreement, Protestants and Roman Catholics, killing this man because of his teachings. And as we know, many Protestants fled Europe with the idea to seek a place where they could have religious freedom, that they could practice, and worship God according to their conscience and not be afraid of being put to death. That was one of the reasons that Protestants came here to the United States. But 
as history shows us, it was not always religious freedom here in the United States. History tells us, for example, William Robinson and Marmaduke Stevenson, two Quakers who came from England in 1656 to escape religious persecution, are executed in the Massachusetts Bay Colony for their religious belief. The two have violated a law passed by the Massachusetts General Court the year before, banning Quakers from the colony under penalty of death. What else does this beast um, does that is in the same appearance or same characteristics as the first beast that comes out of the water? Let's read. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So we're going to see the resemblance of the first beast with the second beast, how they um, share the same characteristic. So this first beast that comes out of the waters has... Uh, many things. It has the crowns and the ten horns, but we're not going to look into that. We're going to look into the name of blasphemy. Is there anything that the second beast has the same characteristics as the first beast in regards to name of blasphemy? Let's see another characteristics of the first beast. We read, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. So we see how it's, it's decked, it's, it's adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having gold, a golden cup in her hand, and many filthiness of her fornication. Here we see an image of this statue. Um, it's Jupiter, but they just took off the... J.U. and left Peter. So now this pagan god has been changed to Peter, the apostle Peter. And as we see on the image, the um, the metal or the statue, its feet has been worn out because many people show up and they touch its feet, they rub its feet, or they kiss its feet. So that's why this part of its feet has been worn out. So. The first beast has name of blasphemy, is decked with uh, many jewelries and many uh, fashion, as you could you could probably say. So now let's read what Uriah Smith hand down in his time, how they were seeing these things in their time, and how could we see it in our time? A repetition of history. He wrote the following. Yet how many in the Protestant church, in the imitation of the Romish, adopt the title of reverend, which in our version of the scriptures is applied to God alone. Holy and reverend is his name. But not content with this, some become very reverent, and right reverend, and doctors of divinity. The New Testament speaks in the most decided terms against adornments and extravagance in dress, yet where shall we look for a display of the latest fashions? The most costly attire, the most gaudy adornments, the richest diamonds, and the most dazzling jewelry, except in a fashionable assembly in a Protestant church on a pleasant Sunday? All these characteristics he was seen in their time. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church did not partake of this. They were following according to the gospel to dress in a modest way, not using any jewelry. And today we could see how all this is displayed uh, in the Protestant churches. And not only in the Protestant churches, but also in Seventh-day Adventist Church, where there's a lot of jewelry worn, um, very heavy makeup, and... All this is because what the scripture says. The scripture says that this beast or this city, Great Babylon, has given of the wine of her fornication to all nations for them to drink. Churches, they have this 
dances. Um, these were evangelicals, but all this is being also introduced into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We see how the Pathfinders, they um, imitate the Protestant world uh, because the, t the thought is to bring in more people. Here we see a Seventh-day Adventist school having a competition of dance. When um, could we thought of this happening right in the church? And in the uh, camp meetings for Pathfinders, um, you we see all this kind of display. And yet many churches attend these meetings where the little ones are very uh, attracted to this kind of uh, environment, right? So the devil uses these things to attract youth to um, be part of the world. All these customs, all these teachings and practices is because of the wine of our fornication. Uh, most community have been drinking of the wine of our fornication. Uh, religious communities, religious bodies. Let's see what else does the scripture tells us in regards to uh, Babylon and its daughters or her daughters. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So this third angel is a warning message. It says, if any man worship the beast and his image. So there is a warning. And if we are going to drink, we also will drink of the wrath of God. And I'm sure nobody wants to drink of the wrath of God. So the thing that needs to be done is stop drinking the wine of our fornication. Stop accepting its teachings, its customs, and its practices. And what is the solution that is given to us? What does the scripture say about this? What is the solution? And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her place. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. The solution then is to come out, because it has given all the nations to drink of the wrath of her fornication. And the only escape is to come out, not to be partakers of her sins, not to continue in its customs, practices, or teachings if they are contrary to the scriptures. Because the scriptures, every doctrine needs to be proven with the Bible. If, if it can't be proven with the Bible, then it is the wine of Babylon, of her fornication. Let's see what else it tells us in regards to this description. The Bible declares that before the coming of the Lord, Satan will work with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. And they that receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, will be left to receive strong delusion that they should believe a lie. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9-11 through 11. Not until this condition shall be reached and the union of the church with the world shall be a fully accomplished throughout Christendom, will the fall of Babylon be complete. The change is a progressive one, and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation is yet future. Throughout Christendom, 
to me, what I'm understanding is that the wine of her fornication will be drank by all nations and throughout Christendom. And the call by the fourth angel, the angel from Revelation 18, is to come out of her, my people. And then these people are to unite together. A group of people that will have nothing uh, that relates to the wine of her fornication, any of her teachings. Nothing that is contrary to the scripture will this people have. Because that is the reason of coming out of Babylon. Because they do not want to continue with its teachings which are contrary to the scriptures. Let's continue. A moral fall. The fall of Babylon here spoken of cannot be literal destruction. For there are events to take place in Babylon. After her fall, which utterly forbid this idea, as for instance, the people of God are there after her fall and are called out in order that they may not receive of her plagues. And in this place is embraced her literal destruction. The fall is therefore a moral one, for the result of it is that Babylon becomes the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. These are terrible descriptions of apostasy, showing that, as a consequence of her fall, she piles up an accumulation of sins even to the heavens and becomes subject to the judgments of God, which can no longer be delayed. And since the fall here introduced is a moral one, it must apply to some branch of Babylon besides or outside of the pagan or papal divisions. For from the beginning of their history, paganism has been a false religion and the papacy an apostate one. And further, as this fall is said to occur but a short period before Babylon's final destruction, certainly this side of the rise and predicted triumph of the papal church, this testimony cannot apply to any religious organization but such as have sprung from that church. These started out on reform. They ran well for a season and had the approbation of God. But fencing themselves about with creeds, they have failed to keep pace with the advancing light of prophetic truth and hence have been left in a position where they will finally develop a character as evil and odious in the sight of God as that of the church from which they first withdrew as dissenters or reformers. Creeds, man-made creeds, creeds that are not supported by the Bible. See, our Bible is our creed. Every doctrine, like I was saying, should be proven with the scriptures. Now, here Uriah Smith says something very important about the reformers. See, when the reformers or Protestants came to this nation to seek for religious freedom, it was to advance in light, to search out the truth. But what happened was that they became satisfied. They were stagnant. And then they became um, or started to make a creed out of man-made ideas that do not support, are not supported by the scriptures. And this made me remember a quote by James White speaking about the reformers that they did not continue to reform. He wrote the following. The greatest fault we can find in the Reformation is the reformers stopped reforming. Had they gone on and onward till they had left the last vestige of papacy behind, such as natural immortality, sprinkling, the Trinity, and Sunday keeping, the church would now be free from her unscriptural errors. And that's what the wine of her fornication is. Unscriptural errors. Things that are not supported by the Bible. Like Sunday, nowhere in the scriptures could you find that God blessed the first day of the week or sanctified it also the first day of the week. There's no mention of that in the first day. He did that with the seventh day, 
Saturday or the Sabbath day. Let's continue to read. Since this message has followed the warning of the judgment, it must be given in the last days. Therefore, it cannot refer to the Roman church alone, for that church has been in a falling condition for many centuries. Furthermore, in the 18th chapter of the Revelation, the people of God are called upon to come out of Babylon. According to the scripture, many of God's people must still be in Babylon. The great sin charge against Babylon is that she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This cup of intoxication, which she presents to the world, represents the false doctrines that she has accepted as the result of her unlawful connection with the great ones of the earth. Friendship with the world corrupts her faith. And in her turn, she exerts a corrupting influence upon the world by teaching doctrines which are opposed to the plainest statement of holy writ. Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots. By her daughters must be symbolized churches that cling to her doctrines and traditions and follow her example of sacrificing the truth and the approval of God in order to form an unlawful alliance with the world. The message of Revelation 14 announcing the fall of Babylon must apply to religious bodies that were once pure and have become corrupt. The message is that they must come out because he has given all nations to drink of her fornications and we do not want to be partakers of our sins. We don't want to continue teaching or listening to doctrines that are not supported by the scripture. So when does this reach its limits so that God um, visits her with the judgments? When? We do not know. We don't have an exact date. We don't have a date. But in the scriptures, there are many instances where the Bible does tell us or gives us an idea of certain nations when they reach their limits. For example, let's read from Genesis chapter 15. Verse number 16. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. What happened with the Amorites? Although the Amorites were idolaters whose life was justly forfeited by their great wickedness, God spared them 400 years to give them unmistakable evidence that He was the only true God, the Maker of heaven and earth. All His wonders in bringing Israel from Egypt were known to them. Sufficient evidence was given. They might have known the truth, had they been willing to turn from their idolatry and licentiousness, but they rejected the light and clung to their idols. On reaching the border of the Amorites, Israel had asked permission only to travel directly through the country, promising to observe the same rules that had governed their intercourse with other nations. When the Amorite king refused this courteous solicitation, and they finally gathered his host for battle, their cup of iniquity was full, and God would now exercise his power for their overthrow. 400 years, they heard of the evidence. They just did not want to accept. For more than 400 years, this nation welcomed the Protestants, the Protestant, this earth, according to prophecy, um, allowed the woman to flee from the dragon, that persecution, to come to this nation, to seek for religious freedom, and to continue to search for the truth. But not continuing in that uh, step of wanting to know the truth, like Uriah Smith and James White wrote, that the reformers did not continue to reform they stay stagnant. Many Protestant churches 
Uh, they embrace the Trinity uh, God, which is unscriptural. There is no foundation that supports that teaching. Nowhere in the Bible does it say one God composed by three persons or one God in three persons. There only is a mention of one God, the Father, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6. The one God which Jesus even called his own Father that he is the only true God. That is John 17, 3, calling his Father the only true God, whom from all things flow. He is the source of everything, the life and the spirit. All comes from the Father through his Son and to his people. There is no scripture that supports the Trinity doctrine. And there are many others, like the state of the dead, that uh, once you die, you could either go to purgatory or go to heaven with no need of Christ coming to resurrect you. That is unscriptural. So all this, those who are being called out to come up out of Babylon will not come with these type of teaching, these doctrines that are not supported with the Bible. This nation has had more than 400 years to advance in light. And just like the Amorites, the Amorites had 400 years of evidence. But what happened? The time came when they faced the Israelites, they were ready for battle. They were going to destroy Israel. And that was when God um, came with his judgment. And so with this nation, this nation, like Project 2025, who has many good things in their agenda, they also have the Sunday law to have Sunday um, off for everyone so that they could go to church which going to church is a good thing. But when you put in a law, which later on will enforce everyone to keep it holy and say that Sunday is the Sabbath day and not Saturday or the seventh day, um, the seventh day of the week, then those who refuse the agenda of the Sunday law will be persecuted. Just like the Amorites wanted to destroy the Israelites, this nation, when it gets to that point, and only God will know how far he will allow, because there will be persecution, but they, he will act. Because the Bible does says that they have void, they have made void his law. And it is time for him to act. This is very soon to happen. As like I said, Project 2025 has this under their agenda, the Sunday law. And as prophecy shows us, also in Daniel 11, we can see how soon probation is to close. Let's see what else Uriah Smith wrote. Speaking about the United States welcoming the Protestants, right? It says, under these circumstances, a body of religious heroes at length determined to seek in the wilds of America that measure of civil and religious freedom which they so much desired. In pursuance of their noble purpose, 100 of these voluntary exiles landed from the Mayflower on the coast of New England, December 22, 1620. Here, says Martin, New England was born, and this was its first baby cry, a prayer and a thanksgiving to the Lord. From here on, many have come to this nation seeking religious freedom. But that is soon to stop because the second beast which comes out of the earth is like a lamb, has two horns, but then will speak like a dragon, enforcing religious laws, and those who are oppose them will be persecuted. Let's see what else. Um, A.T. Jones penned about this great nation. He starts off speaking about Rome. That prophecy in the scripture of Rome was written for the last days, and it is not in vain. It was written for us in the last days. The history of Rome was written in the prophecy, closed up and sealed until the last time. And you know it. Why was the history of Rome included in that prophecy before it occurred? 
and closed up and sealed until now, so long after it occurred, so that it should be a light upon what is occurring in these last days, because history repeats itself, and that which occurred then occurs now again. And the Republic, the great ancient Republic, which stood at the head of the world in enlightenment and in all that went to make a nation, degenerated into the greatest despotism that ever was upon the earth, Rome. And when this last great republic, this latter-day single great republic, having stood as the light of the world, goes over the same course exactly as Rome did, it will end exactly where Rome ended. And that is written in the 24th of Matthew and the 21st of Luke as warning to the people in this time. This nation was blessed. It has been blessed. And many Protestants have been stagnant, have not continued to seek the truth. But there is a group, a group of people that God calls them to come out of Babylon, to not be partakers of her sins, to not keep um, partaking of its traditions, its practices, its teachings that are unscriptural. The call is to come out, to be united in the same platform of truth, which there is only one truth, and it is the doctrines that are found in the Bible. People need to come out. God's people. Will they listen? Will we listen to that call to come out and not be partakers of our sins? Probation is soon to close. And God's people needs to wake up because he is coming very soon. And only those who listen to this call to come out of her will be saved will receive the pouring of the Spirit and give the loud cry. Let's pray that we can be that group that listens to the voice of God.